Okay, this book is called, this is a book review called Talent is Overrated by Jeff Colvin. Jeff Colvin has a BA in economics from Harvard, MBA in business. Um, the main point of the book is that if a performer, athlete, musician, scholar, puts in years of deliberate, dedicated practice, they can dramatically improve their performance way beyond their uh, genetic ability. Things that optimize performance is they can start young, like Amadeus Mozart. His father was a great musician and coached him. Um, having a parent that's supportive and encourages the kid makes a tremendous difference. Um, that the parent, that also there's time for training. You know, the kid doesn't just have to work on the farm all day. Having a good local coach helps a lot to get kids started. And you see that, for example, in sports. If the coach is good, the wrestling team's good every year. Not like that school has that great a talent. I've seen running teams and wrestling teams like Farina over at East Leiden. He always had a lot of successful wrestlers because he was a good coach. Eventually, the kid has to have internal motivation because in order to practice that much and put in so much effort, it has to come from within. They have to believe in the possibility of success. They have that growth mindset like Carol Dweck, the psychologist out of Stanford, talks about. To believe that you can improve your performance by practicing more. It's worth the effort. They also have to have devotion to the activity, willing to give up other things. You know, they have to stay away from nonsense like alcohol, MJ, that type of silliness. They also, the great ones, have to be able to handle constructive criticism. Um, a lot of people can't. I got lots of friends, adults, you know, you say one thing critical, they go into this emotional hissy fit, so there's no point in talking to them, and that prevents them from improving. A good performer should have good metacognition, the ability to think about their own thinking, about their own performance, to be able to judge it objectively. And, you know, when they see a mistake, try to fix it rather than try to hide it. Um, as they get more successful in advance, they want to move on to a more regional coach. And they should also be studying role models. If you're, you want to be a musician, study great musicians. You want to be a scholar, study great scholars. Um, if you want to be a writer, study great writers. Okay, Deliberate practice, this by the way, comes out of the work of Anders Ericsson, K. Anders Ericsson. He's the guy who wrote about, it typically takes about 10,000 hours of practice, which usually means about 10 years to become great at something, okay, to create uh, expert level performance. And he says it requires deliberate practice, and that's different than just practicing for fun. Like it might be fun to hit tennis balls with your friend, fun to shoot hoops with your friend, but that's not the same as deliberate practice whereby you're challenging yourself, yourself constantly at the edge of your ability, going beyond the comfort zone to improve yourself. An example was talking about figure skaters. The great figure skaters spend a lot of time practicing over and over again the most difficult moves or jumps or whatever it might be so they get better at them and eventually can do them successfully in a competition versus somebody who's just doing it for fun might keep on staying in their comfort zone doing easy stuff. Okay, so what was good about the book? Um, I like the way he gave a lot of practical examples of a growth mindset and uh, showed examples of where it made a big difference for people who were performing way beyond what someone would expect them to achieve. So that's good. Um, I think intellectual stuff is much more changeable than physical stuff. You know, a person who's willing to study, like let's say you're not as smart as somebody else. Well, if you study a lot more than them and have better study skills, you could probably do as well as them academically. I've done that all my life, okay? Um, there's a lot of things you can really learn well if you put the time in. You can learn how to draw. You can learn another language. You can learn a lot of good things from that extra study time. Because in some sense, you know, academics is like a race. It's a competition. You know, who's going to learn the stuff first, get the good SAT scores, get the good grades, go on to grad school in their particular field? That's a significant part of it. Uh, but I think in physical stuff, it's not like that. Not Nowhere near as changeable. I mean, if you're short, you can't be a great basketball player, realistically. Yeah, I know there might be one ex exception to that, but in general, that's true. If you want to be a pro football player, you better be a big guy, okay, because those guys are giants. Um, I think, though, in academics, you can usually do a lot more to improve yourself. Um, let's see. There's some mention of culture, and that makes a big difference. For example, the culture of ancient Greece in Athens, they greatly valued um, skill in writing, and they had a lot of great playwrights and historians. They valued thinking and debate. They had a lot of great philosophers, okay? When a society values something, you get more of it. The Renaissance Italians valued painters 
and they would, you know, paint all these religious paintings in the churches and the illiterate people would get educated by them. They valued that, okay? And so did Rome. And there was a competition between Florence and Rome. The competition also generates increased effort and better performance. Um, you also have to have open-mindedness, free speech expression to allow different types of uh, new things to emerge. You know, for example, in Egypt, I had read about uh, many, many years ago, for a couple thousand years, there was zero improvement in art because none of it was allowed, okay? And so if you don't allow creativity and people to change things, you don't get any change. You don't get any innovation. Um, I actually think that good study skills can increase academic performance by about 30 points, 30 IQ points. You know, it's a, it's a disgrace that high schools and colleges um, and, and, and grade schools don't teach memory techniques and study skills. They really don't. Um, and all you got to do is study memory contest champions. And, you know, for me, when I went to college, I never had taken uh, honors class in high school. My parents were fuzzy foreigners. But when I went to Stanford, I luckily found a guy who was a great student. And I just copied his methods of studying, and I got way better. When I went to med school, I was also a little bit behind at first because I had not taken the classes before, unlike a lot of the kids. I found the guy who graduated first in his class, and I just begged him, how did you do it? How did you, how'd you get so good at med school? And he told me, you know, the big thing he did is he bought the other notes from a year in advance. And so he would read a tremendous amount before class. And I started doing that. And after that, biochemistry became easy for me. And I loved it. Okay, but before that, I was kind of overwhelmed by it. Um, having religious inspiration can make a big difference, too. A lot of the great geniuses are really religiously inspired. And, you know, for me, it was Alfred Adler inferiority complex. I was so mad at myself for losing my skill as an athlete after being injured repeatedly because I kept coming back too soon that I vowed I'm not going to be ever be lazy in academics because I want to be successful in this. I kind of figured maybe my life will get good again. I'll have a good social life again. Stanford was lonely and miserable for me. Four years, I never had a girlfriend at Stanford. Okay, that's a long time for a young guy. Okay, in high school, I always had a nice girlfriend. Okay, um, they got to have other things to become a great performer. You got to have good time management, self-discipline, a sense of purpose. And I really think a lifelong commitment to a sense of purpose so that you're always doing the work and learning. Because you learn a little bit each day. you got to put the effort in each day. And so if your goal is just to make money, you're going to learn what you have to do to make money. But if your goal is to be great, then you're going to do what it takes to try to become great. And that takes a lot more effort. Um, you have to be open-minded to new ideas. You know, Try them out. See if they're good or not. Um, I think for academic stuff, you have to enjoy reading because you're going to read a ton. And it helps a lot if you enjoy intelligent conversation because eventually to present your ideas, you have to converse with other people and present them. Um, somebody who's still wanting to learn, you can keep getting better and better in your 50s and 60s. And that's one of the reasons why I decided to go into medicine compared to other things. You know, for example, I first I th one time I thought I wanted to be a wildlife veterinarian. OK, uh, but then I said to myself, you know, I'll be out in podunk and there'll be no money. There'll be no ongoing education. I'll be bored. That's why I didn't go down that path, even though I was real into nature stuff a long time ago. Um, I know a lot of doctors with very high IQs who don't know anything except for medicine. Okay, these are guys IQs, you know, 145, 150. But, you know, you talk to them about anything outside of their medical field and they're ignoramuses. And there's a reason for that. The reason is to them, they want to make money and they know if they do their medical job, they make money. But if they were to study nutrition, biochemistry, literature, religion, history, there'd be no money in that. So they don't care about it. It's a waste of time to them. Okay. And I know some of these guys, I'm friends with them. And there's been times amongst some of them where they've been a little jealous or resentful of me. And um, they'll like challenge me intellectually. And, you know, I'll just beat the crap out of them because I've been reading diligently on all these subjects for decades. So if they're going to try to tease me about some historical fact or philosophical quote or something, I just know tons more than them. It's not even, there's no, they're not even in the ballpark. Um, and they kind of freak out by that because they're used to kind of being like the big dog academically, but they, they haven't paid their dues. Okay. I spent, you know, at Stanford, I was so lonely. I didn't have a girlfriend in four years. There were no parties on the weekends. It's like in the middle of a farm and you're out in a field. Okay. So you know, Saturday for me was just another day to study all day long, Sunday all day long. And I got in the habit of doing that. And you see that often in times in people who develop well intellectually. You know, perhaps I didn't, I screwed up plenty of things socially, financially, I could have done a lot better. But what I'm saying is that time to just read, you know, for example, Talleyrand, the, the French uh, political economic genius, he, when he was young, he had a club foot, so he lost his inheritance because of that. The family wanted the younger brother with, uh, you know, a healthy leg to, to take the inheritance 
you know, primogenitor type. And so he was sent to the priesthood and he just had a lot of time sitting around in the, in the library and he just read everything he'd get his hands on. And he became, you know, intellectually ahead of uh, his cohort. Um, to get really good, you got to do stuff that doesn't make sense financially. You just do it because you want to get good. Uh, for example, right now I want to try to be a great doctor in my field and in, in some related fields. So I'll give lectures every month for free. I do it because I know I learn a lot in preparing those lectures. I try to follow outcomes. If I see an interesting case, there's no money in, in, in giving a rat's tail about what eventually happens to a patient. Doctors do not get paid to know what happens to a patient. Like let's say you're an emergency room doctor. An interesting case comes through, you stabilize the patient, you get them admitted up to the floor to the ICU, done, okay? But if you really wanna become great, in my opinion, you should follow that patient and see what happened one week, two weeks, three weeks later, so you know, did you make all the best decisions? And so when you're gonna run into that scenario again down the road, that's how you get really good. And that takes a lot of time and effort. And that's why most people don't wanna do it. There's no immediate financial reward for doing so. Um, another typical situation is you have to be willing to accept what I would call a lot of embarrassment and humiliation quite often to get really good. When I did my fellowship at Harvard in vascular interventional radiology, imaging guided surgery, we were in a sense taking cases that used to be done by the surgeons with open surgical procedures. We were doing angioplasties and stents in the pelvis and in the lower extremities that they used to do bypass operations on. So they were pissed off, okay? And they hated our guts and they would try to insult us whenever they could. They sort of had more clout in the hospital at Harvard, you know, Brigham and Women's Hospital than we did, all right? So we had a monthly conference with them where we go over all the best cases of the month and they would do their best to insult us and try to humiliate us. None of the attendings in my program were willing to speak in front of them. Um, and there were three fellows. One of the fellows was a guy who didn't speak English so good and he didn't like it because he would get humiliated. They were really articulate guys. These are world famous vascular surgeons. One of them was Andrew Wittenberg. Another one was Mike Belkin. And they were kind of nasty about it, especially Belkin. You know, like Belkin would stand right in my face, stick his chest out, and he'd say, radiology. It's a good field for a woman. My wife's a radiologist. Basically saying you're a wuss if you're a radiologist instead of a vascular surgeon. Surgeons tend to be pretty egotistical. It used to be almost all male dominated in the 1990s when I came of age as a doctor. And, you know, they're kind of sleep deprived. You have to have a bit of a hot head. You have to think surgery is the greatest thing in the world in order to be willing to be sleep deprived for a couple of years on end. So that's kind of the personality of it, you know. Um, I actually kind of laughed when he sort of stuck his chest out like he was going to beat me up. I thought it was funny. You know, I was a wrestler. I could have crushed him if I wanted to. Of course not. But I'm just saying that was the mentality of it. Medicine used to be a lot more confrontational and surgeons used to have a lot more temper tantrums and uh, emotional outbursts and throwing stuff and swearing at people. That used to be relatively much more, it wasn't that common, but it was still common enough in the 1990s, okay? Uh, there's a lot more female doctors now than there used to be. Um, anyway, so in order to speak in front of the, the vascular surgeons, I was like, bring it on, guys. I'll, I'll go head to head with you guys. And so I took um, courses in vascular surgery technique. I, I read all their vascular surgery journals. I subscribed and read all their journals. I went through all the VHS courses on vascular surgery. I went to a course for training for surgical assistants and got trained in how to do their procedures so I could speak more effectively, more knowledgeably on their procedures. Um, I would try to get people to help me prepare my cases. A lot of times I just had to do them by myself. But the point was, I was the only person willing to do that, okay? Because it was a bit of a humiliating experience. But I knew I would learn a lot from it, and I did. Uh, the best doctors, they know more than other doctors do. They not only know what they have to know to generate billing codes, but they know more because they want to know more. They put the extra time into study. They have put the extra time into doing a procedure. A lot of times it comes down to taking a case you don't really want to take because uh, of time constraints, but you do it because you're going to learn from it. Um, you have to read in other fields, not just your own field, but the fields adjacent to your field because that's how you learn stuff. There's, each literature is narrowed to its own what generates billing codes in that particular field. Um, and you have to become, I think, more articulate as a better writer and a better speaker because eventually you're going to have to communicate your findings either in writing or in a presentation to other uh, other doctors and audience and you're going to be better. Like if you read the best scientific papers, the the authors are quite literate and they'll, they'll use all kinds of metaphors. They'll put it into a narrative story form. That makes the paper much better. Um, the other thing is you have to pay your dues, which often is kind of tedious and painful and time consuming. For example, Chris Rock, the comedian, would do lots of small shows, comedy shows, before he'd get ready for a big show. 
And a perfect example like that is with a wrestler. If you want to be good at wrestler, you know, be state champion in high school, you know, all American or national champion in college, you got to wrestle in all in the in the entire off season. You got to go to the the uh, spring tournaments. You got to go to summer tournaments. Get that extra experience. Okay. So what was bad about the book? Um, I thought parts of it were unrealistic. He kind of had a little bit of this, you know, overly optimistic. Anybody can do anything if they just try hard. And that's, you know, obviously that's not true. Like we said, you're not going to be a great basketball player if you're short, okay? You're not going to be a great runner and sprint if you can't run fast. Um, and he kind of acted like IQ doesn't matter. And I think IQ is overrated. I think, it, you know, here, let me just give you some quotes by Jordan Peterson on IQ. So Jordan Peterson is, you know, the famous psychologist, and he's a pretty bright guy. He does talk a lot about IQ, and uh, here's what he says. He says, IQ is the most real thing in all of psychology. If you want to throw out IQ results, then you might as well throw out all of psychology. And then he says, IQ predicts performance in complex jobs because these complex jobs have lots of random intellectual problems, just like an IQ test. Then he says, persons with IQs of 85 or less, they are not good at anything intellectual. Okay. He also says that IQ cannot be changed. No one's found out how to change it. And that's absolutely BS. It's, it's easy to change IQ. If you want to get better with words, then you have to read more. You have to have more intelligent conversations. I can also tell you if you, if you decide that it's possible to improve at studying and you decide to study study skills, you'll get better at it. Grade school, high school, college, and even grad school is mostly just memorization for most fields. So study memorization techniques. They make a big difference, okay? Learn walk and talk, condensed notes, flashcards. Learn all this stuff. Most students don't know any of this stuff because it's not taught in any of the grade schools or high schools or even the colleges routinely. So you have to seek it out. You have to also study role models in your field. If you want to be great at a particular field, study the people who are already great at it. For anything you want to learn, study the person who already knows it, what they did, how they, what they do, how they got good at it. So I think he's totally wrong about that. College professors tend to be very narrow-minded and just function in their own clique of mentality. And it kind of makes them a little bit stupid. Like, for example, like if you ever read a book about male-female relationships, the college professors, their books always stink. And then you read about some guy who just, you know, dated women and talks about it. It could potentially be a really useful book because he's talking from objective experience and reality versus, you know, the college narrow-minded nonsense where they can't even tell a man from a woman. Okay, so anyways, um, what else? He also doesn't talk much about the inspiration. You know, having a sense of inspiration makes a giant difference. He talks a little bit about it. Um, having a religious inspiration can make a giant difference. Tons of the greatest achievers ever in the history of the world were inspired by God. Michelangelo, I do everything out of my, my love for God and my appreciation. I put all my hope in him, okay? Uh, Isaac Newton, I do everything, you know, seeking to answer the questions of God, okay? Uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. I dedicate every composition to the glory of God. All right, so that's a good thing, okay? For me, you know, becoming great at biochemistry, I basically said it's the language that God uses to write the book of life, so I must learn this. I thought it was beautiful, and the fact that I thought it was beautiful, that motivated me to study a lot. It was a pleasure to have the opportunity to study biochemistry. Um, what else? Um, you got to seek out competitions in your field if, it, if that's relevant, you know? Um you need to have time to read. That's what I meant about being lonely as a child can be a good thing. That's why I think it's very overrated for kids to be running around with their friends all the time. Let the kid be alone a little bit and find a book to read, okay? Let him learn to entertain himself by reading a book. That will be very beneficial for your kid. Um, some ethnic groups overachieve relative to their IQs, and I think it's because of their culture. And a typical example is, you know, Chinese. Remember Ti Ti Tiger Mom? I think it was Amy Chua wrote that book. It's a great book. Um, Korean kids. Uh, Japanese kids, the Asians, they tend to push their kids a lot academically. And there's a funny story, I'll tell you. I had a friend, Korean kid I was friends with in med school. And we both lived at home our first year of med school. And we were talking one day and I said, man, my mom's driving me crazy. I think I'm going to move to the on-campus dorms next year. And he said, me too. And I said to him, and he's like, well, what do you mean your mom drives you crazy? I said, my mom's always, you know, sort of bugging me. She's always saying stuff to me like, Peter, you are a nerd. You study too much. That is not normal. You should go out more. You should socialize more. Why don't you date Linda at the tennis club? She's a very nice girl. That be my mom was always saying stuff to me like that. Versus he goes, are you kidding me? He goes, my mom's the opposite. My mom, this is a Korean mom. He goes, my mom tells me you are in med school now. You should not be talking on the phone. Med students should not talk up on the phone. You have no time for friends. Med student must study. Med student have no time for friends. <laughs> Which I found rather amusing. His mother was a doctor too. I actually know his mother. She's a very nice lady, but that's kind of funny. 
and put a lot of pressure on the kid, you know. My parents didn't put any pressure, didn't really put much pressure on me. It was For me, it came from within. Um, let's see. Some ethnic groups, I think, tend to underachieve relative to their IQ. I know lots of white Christians, they're kind of lazy, okay? I also have seen a lot of kids deteriorate academically when their parents bought them cell phones at a young age. The kids stopped reading, lost their intellectual interest, only cared about their little clique of friends. Um, it's, it's bad for kids. A lot of these kids will sleep next to their phone. They're sending 100 text messages a day. It turns them into idiots when all they care about is their social circle rather than anything intellectual or their own personal intellectual development. Um, I've also noticed there's differences in ethnic groups about how much they like to read, okay? First of all, I learned as a young medical student and doctor, no one gives a rat's ass about books other than a small elite intellectual circles. I used to try talking to people about books and people would always give me this bored look on their face and very few had any interest in that other than a few really smart doctor friends. And that's actually where I started to memorize jokes because I found that, and I was a little socially, socially awkward when I first came out of college and med school age. And so I would memorize all these joke books and comedy routines because I know people loved it when I would tell jokes. But they didn't, they didn't respond to the books other than a few, like I said, uh, intellectual types that are rare. Um, my Puerto Rican cousins, for example, are very smart. i got a really smart Puerto Rican family. Uh, tons of them are doctors. But they could give a rat's tail about literature. I can't remember ever having an intellectual conversation about literature with my, the Puerto Rican side of my family. My mother's from Puerto Rico. My father's from Ireland. Okay, on the other hand, my Irish family, they talk about books all the time. And a lot of my Irish family are kind of stupid. They're relatively average in their intelligence overall, and I totally disagree with a lot of stuff they say. But I like the fact they're literary. They'll talk with you about history. Every Irish person knows a good amount of European history because they've been getting their butt kicked by you know Britain for so long. Believe me, they know British history and the you know connection of it to Irish history going back hundreds of years. Okay. Um, I also noticed that my Irish friends, you know, my wife's from Poland. Okay, and so I know a lot of Polish people, a lot of Eastern Europeans, and in my experience, they're not very literary either. You know, for some of them, there's a language barrier, but it also just seems to be their culture as being kind of pragmatic. Like my Puerto Rican cousins, their attitude is get good grades in school, become a doctor, then you make money, have a nice life. Okay, uh, whereas the Polish are kind of the same way. You know, with my wife, that actually caused disagreements between her and I about how to raise the children. Her attitude was like, let the kid get good grades in school, then the kid can become a doctor and make money and have a decent life. And I'd be kind of like, let them develop intellectually, let them pursue their interests. Because my attitude is, if you become a good student, it doesn't matter what the subject is. You just learn how to be a good student. And then you can always do well in whatever subject you take. You, you just pick it later. So anyways, what I'm trying to say is, um, the Polish, in my experience, had a relatively pragmatic view of life. Learn how to, you know, fix things around the house because you'll save money that way. Rather than, I'm curious about fixing things around the house. I don't know how to explain it, but there's actually a big difference there. And I think it's it's good, you know, my way better, of course, than my wife's way. But of course, that's how it always is. So anyways, the long story of this book, what do you get out of it? The fact that academic performance can be improved tremendously, as well as performance in things that are intellectual, like playing a musical instrument and being a businessman. The guy who wrote is a businessman, so he had tons and tons of business examples, which I found kind of boring. But whatever it is intellectually, that can happen. Uh, for for physical sports, you can improve performance a lot. It depends on the details. Uh, so anyways, you know, I thought it was a decent book. It's not a great book, but it was a good book.